hello and welcome to a special Ann Arbor District Library dis book discussion um, for the book of poetry, Things You May Find Hidden in My Ear by Mosab Luchoa. And we wanted to discuss this book because it was chosen as the 2024 title for One Book, Many Communities, which is a program by the librarians and archivists of Palestine. Um, so before we get into it, we should probably all introduce ourselves. My name is Marissa, and I work in the Outreach Department at the library. Yeah, my name is Lauren, and I'm a desk clerk at the Ann Arbor District Library. And I'm excited to speak with everybody today about this book. I'm Beth, and I am also on the outreach team at the library. I'm Valerie. I work in collections as a cataloger. I'm Lucy. I am a library tech in the youth department. I'm Roosevelt. I am also a desk clerk at the library. And I'm Lily. I'm a PLA. Um, so this book of poetry was published in English in 2022. And it won the 2022 Palestine Book Award and the 2023 American Book Award. And it's poems about life under occupation. It's about war and life and death and identity and a whole lot more. Um, so I guess we'll just kind of ease our way in with what did, why did you want to engage with this book and kind of what's your relationship to poetry? I'll jump in. Um, well, my relationship to poetry is I've I've enjoyed poetry um, for a long time, even as a kid, and um, making it not, you know, not a lot, but but I have I've been I've written some poems, haiku, uh, but anyway, um, but this book, well, you know, the topic, um, and I. I have to disclose, you know, I, I am Jewish and um, maybe I don't have to disclose it, but I, it's, um, it's made me see things, the whole, the whole situation, not just the poetry, but, but um, it's just in a way that is like, uh, I've been misled. That's how I feel as a as a Jewish person um but uh, it's not about me I'm just saying that's I've had a lot of um conflict you know internal conflict so anyway yeah I also just wanted to say um I I think what inspired me to want to read this book um, was wanting to get out of the churn of news around um, you know, um, events in Gaza uh, and really into the shoes of people who are, are living there, have experience there. And so when I saw this opportunity to read, I thought, yeah, I'm, 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 I want to get out of like the land of statistics and like hard facts and almost the dehumanization that inevitably kind of occurs almost like before I know it from reading article after article, update after update, and back into like a place where someone with a lot of intention and care is, is communicating a message that feels very accessible and human, and I which I found this book to, to do. Yeah, I would uh, piggyback off of what Lauren said. Like, I, it, I wanted to find something like that was giving a human voice to what we're seeing and hearing about. Um, and I had read an article or see, like about this poet um, being kidnapped, like for like three days after um, October seventh, and so that the name was kind of like ringing a bell and I just was really curious to actually hear about, about 
him from him as a person. And um, as far as poetry, like I, I read some poetry, but I really enjoy reading poetry when I know that I'm going to discuss it with people because I think it helps to enhance it. And um, everybody, I think, brings different things to and from the poems that they read. Uh, for me, I was drawn to this book sort of as a secondary reaction after I noticed my first reaction to the idea of reading the book was fear. Like I was, I was afraid to engage with this book. You know, of course, I'm trying to keep up as best as I can, like Lauren was saying, with what's going on. But the idea of, you know, really allowing, opening myself up to a raw human poetic perspective was was scary to me and I, I felt like that was that was my sign that I really needed to to make that step you know uh, it's it's a privilege to to have that feeling at all so I'm grateful so many of you are also you know here by my side with it for me um I've always enjoyed poetry in the last few years I haven't read that much. But in the last few years, I've also been really trying to read things from cultural perspectives that are not mine. So a lot of Indigenous, a lot of people of color, um, authors, that kind of thing. So, um, and with everything that's going on, I thought this would be a good way to hear the voice of a Palestinian whose experiences are so far from mine and and maybe get a, a better understanding. I read, um, I believe the article that Lucy referred to, Mossad wrote a piece for the New Yorker at the beginning of the year detailing his experiences being detained. So. Um, I had read that and that made me interested when I realized this book was by him. Um, I also think I went to college with a lot of people from the Middle East, including a lot of Palestinians. Um, and so I had heard about their experiences um, and I obviously learned a lot about the history of the region in college, but I think I didn't really engage with it much there because uh, it felt overwhelming as I think a lot of people feel because it's a very, um, there's a lot of history there and a lot of emotion. Um, so it wasn't until after I left school that I, um, you know, really feel like took the time to educate myself. And so I wanted to go back like Lauren and Lucy were saying to having a human perspective and hearing human stories again, now that I feel like I have more context for them. Yeah, I learned about poetry in school, obviously, um, didn't really love it at the time, only as an adult, I've been like, oh, maybe I do like poetry, <laughs> and I've been reading more about it. Um, and I started reading this last, in the winter sometime, I don't know, um, it had come up on a list of like, recommended things to read and I had started reading it then kind of put it down because it was a lot um and so this talk kind of gave me the excuse the push I needed to finish it um which I was really grateful for um I want to kind of circle back to something Roosevelt said about fear um so in the book of poems there's also an interview with the author at the end um and it's about kind of trauma and expression and communication and how poetry is a form of processing. And one of the interviews question was, what do you think to happens to people who cannot find a way to process and express what's happened to them? And the author's response was, it means that they will have lived through, or it means that what they have lived through will not leave them and it will come back to them in their nightmares. Um, and so I'm just glad that we're able to process this all together. <laughs> um, and at any point, you can either reflect just in general, or maybe if you want to, if there's a poem that specifically that reminded you of, um, we can kind of hop around to any of the poems. 
Um, so I really liked that. And then I also wanted to talk about just in general growth and different versions of yourself. This book was published in 2022. A lot of these poems that I assume were written before that. He talks a lot about like 2014 and what happened then. Um, and then it's interesting just to come at it right now in the current context. Um, yeah, so I guess just how are you experiencing the timeline of this it's so much longer than the news media kind of reports on it yeah that was really striking to me when i was reading this that uh, like all of this was written before what is happening now um yet to read it like now um i mean it seems like it could be written now and then so i was just really like struck by the the vastness of it and the as you were saying marissa how long it's been going on and and i just started to write down these dates you know um and it's it's just sort of uh i don't even know what the word is but but it was something that i definitely thought about a lot when i was reading this i also think for me the concept of time was important in reading this book because Mosab is about three years older than I am. So we're very close in age and I have very different lives for so many reasons. I'm American, you know, I don't have three children right now, you know, but him talking about these dates, bringing up 2014 and being a young person in school, as was I, you know, and his friends at the time, I just, um, all of his reflections really had me also thinking about where I was in each of those years and how vastly different our experiences were at each moment, even though, you know, we were born sort of next to each other. I found it really striking how he sort of measured the passing of time through, through people like through the generations of his own family, tracing his, you know, his lineage back through different um, generations of his family that have had to evacuate and have been displaced and have been separated. Uh, and also through these other names that I didn't recognize and that I ended up, you know, spending half the time I spent reading this book was spent reading about the names mentioned in this book, like other poets and writers and scholars and academics um, over the decades who have contributed in some way or another to, you know, the global conversation about Palestine. Yeah, I'm curious, um, Roosevelt, about what you just said about what other authors you were inspired to learn about based on um, Mossab's poems here. Or is because he dedicates several of these poems right to to um, figures uh, world renowned figures right um, like Edward Said and um, I mean Noam Chomsky I think is another name that I, it comes off the top of my head um, so uh, yeah I'm just curious if that to hear more about what you just said yeah so I, I mean I wrote down the names of some of the poets that he mentioned were Mahmoud Darwish, who is, I believe, the national poet of Palestine, um, was the title that I found for him. Also, two American poets, Audre Lorde and Wanda Coleman. Um, and some of the other writers and academics he mentions are Ibrahim Abu Lugod, who's a Palestinian-American academic. There was, uh, please pardon my pronunciations, there was Hassan Kanafani, who is a novelist and a revolutionary. Um, there's Edward Said, there's Noam Chomsky, uh, Theodore Adorno, who was actually um, a musicologist and a social critic, but I believe he was mentioned because uh, his books were among, his name, it was one of his books that was on the author's shelf and was, you know, displaced or damaged or destroyed during an airstrike. Um, but it was, it was just interesting to use those names and looking up the timelines of when these when these different writers and thinkers were active just to place um the author's ex personal experiences and also just sort of the the history of 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 gaza and of palestine just sort of on on the timeline 
and also just revealing how much I don't know. Yeah, I was Googling the names too. I, I didn't take notes, but, um, but yeah, I was like, who's this one? Who's this one? Um, I just, overall, it was so brutal. It was, it's a brutal situation, story, voice. I, I, it's just shitty. I, I don't know what else to say really. Um, but it just was, it was a hard read. And, and heart, it's not heart. I mean, this is nothing compared to what they're living through. Well, I'm not asking for sympathy. I'm, I'm curious, Beth, if um, you felt like it was at all like kind of like jolting too. I mean, I felt um, um, that it was it was tough, but it was almost like um, I don't know. At times, it felt kind of Kafka esque. Like there's imagery in the poems where like uh, uh, inanimate objects are alive or are crying out or are trying to escape or they're trying to protect themselves. Um, there's also like I didn't think the author. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I referred to him like as, as, as if I knew him with his first name. I'm just going to say um, Masab Toha. Um, now, he he really jolted me with one of the first poems in the book called My Grandfather Was a Terrorist, uh, right? I'm American and was coming of age, um, you know, in high school during like the war on terror, basically, um, the, the quote unquote war on terror. Uh, which I think is um, incidentally doing a lot of like work in this current conflict, like um, the, um, in terms of dehumanizing people, entire populations with terms. So the opening like part of my grandfather was a terrorist goes like this. My grandfather was a terrorist. He tended to his field watered the roses in the courtyard, smoked cigarettes with grandmother on the yellow beach, lying there like a prayer rug. <laughs> you know, and you go, what? And the, the poem continues along these, this vein. Yes, to someone or some entity, my grandfather was definitely a terrorist, but not to me. You know, like that's, that's the message that comes across there, like because my grandfather was a person and not this term that you 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 um pasted him with you know and so in that way it kind of automatic like there are a lot of poems like that i think in this in this book where it like there's terminology that i as like an american have just kind of absorbed over the past you know 20 years as like this is this is kind of how the world is right um uh this is how we americans are taught to view entire populations. Um, and to break through that with this, with, with, with poetry, um, it, it was, it was jolting, right? It was, but also kind of felt like, right, we're, we're breaking through to something that actually feels more real here and human. Yeah. yeah I think um, another poem that kind of reminds me of that it's like, it's, kind of the opposite, but just for your taking this concept that, you know, we hear about and we're told and you're talking about the people behind it or who are the people behind it or who aren't the people behind it. But in that long poem he wrote, um, there's a section where he's talking, he says like the houses were not Hamas, the kids were not Hamas, their clothes and toys were not Hamas. And he goes on to list all these things, these real facets of life that were destroyed none of which had to do with Hamas. And I think um, it, I was kind of thinking about it when you were talking about that poem, Lauren, just because it's like, when you think about separating the words from the people around them, I think a lot of these poems do a really, um, do that very effectively. And that is sort of jolting, but I think in a really important and and good way. So I have one more thing to say and that I will be quiet for a while to let other people talk, but just, yeah, I mean, even like the structure of the book and the decision to incorporate like some, some like pictures to the middle, I felt were like 
oh my God, like I'm getting a window into someone's real life here and almost like a mindset to um, the caption. If uh, uh, it, I'm holding up like a page where there's a picture of strawberries and they look really fresh and plump and delicious. And underneath it says, through it all, the strawberries have never stopped growing. Um, yeah. <laughs> As much as there's poems about these awful things, there's also poems about just like little tiny things in life that are beautiful. Um, and I think at the end in the interview, or maybe it was a different interview that I, listen, I listened to a few, um, where he's talking about how poetry lets him observe the world um, and how it's just this special way of viewing things that let you kind of transcend life and everything that's going on um and then I also just really enjoyed that there's like humor in it still of like these are still people living in a shitty situation and there's some humor in that um like one of the other pictures of a school midterm test <laughs> it's like a multiple choice uh when a drone follows you on your way to school what is it doing a, it's keeping its eye on you so you don't get hit by a car. B, it's watching in case you lose your pocket money on the way. C, it's counting your steps to make sure you're getting your daily exercise. Or D, it's covering your head in case an F-16 drops a bomb on you by mistake. That was one of my favorites. I just, I mean, of the photographs and the captions, um, because it did, it, it, it was a good reminder of the humor that is sort of in here as well. felt like the strawberries and the very last poem of um, A Rose Shoulders Up. Uh, Don't ever be surprised to see a rose shoulder up among the ruins of the house. This is how we survive. It was like, those are tiny little pieces of hope inside, you know, this horrible existence that you know, they live with every day, but to be able to find those little good things is a gift. And I enjoyed that he put that in there as well as the other things. Hope is such a complicated thing in this collection. There's, there's, you know, there's a lot to it there. I, I wrote down a few, um, which one is that on page 49? Um, I don't have the title of it right in front of me. Oh, it's, um, we love what we have. The first line is, we love what we have, no matter how little, because if we don't, everything will be gone. Um, and then in the interview at the end, he talks about this sort of necessity of performing tenacity for the world. Um, the quote that I wrote down is, Gazans have to show the world that they cannot be defeated this idea of hope not only as a sustaining force that you know that shows up in the little joyful moments and of like connection or of beauty day to day but also as this performance that they have to continuously put on in order to sort of show the rest of the world to prove the, to the rest of the world that they are still alive and the to, to you know so, so that the rest of the world doesn't give up on them as a sort of act of of necessity i was really grappling with that i wonder if anybody else was i loved that poem on page 49 that was one of the ones that struck me the most in the book and i love a part later in it where it says um what's here is something that we are still building. It's something we cannot yet see because we are part of it. Um, Cause to me, I think when we talk about like hope, at least in an American context, like often to me, there's sort of this like rosy idea. Like it means that you think something good is happening. Um, and I think what the picture he paints here is not hope as being like certainty that something good will happen, but having a humility that you don't know what will happen. It's like, we can't see what's happening, but we are building something right now. You know, we are doing what needs to be done right now. And then 
something else will happen later, you know, I don't, I don't know if that makes sense, but I think that's a sort of more of a tempered understanding of hope that I see running through this whole book. Um, that really struck me. Um, like a lot of other probably Americans, I'm, I'm, I'm getting the past over the past several months, I've, I've gotten really interested in how Palestinians have expressed themselves over time and expressed, I think, like their hope. Um, one symbol that I've learned um, uh, of, of that I that Palestinians use is a key, um, because many Palestinians, when they were uh, initially um, maybe displaced um, in the aftermath of World War II, took the keys to their homes with them, hoping that they would one day return. And many families, so I'm led to believe, uh, still retain these keys. They're rusty now, but they hold on to them. Um, and there's that kind of some, I, we were speaking just a moment ago about tenacity, and there is a certain like tenaciousness to this also like hopeful gesture. We don't know like, right, like what, what, when the keys, if ever, will be able to be used. Um, um, but like, there's, you were holding on to something there that's really tangible. Um, and, and also showing one another, it's like a way to show, to signal to one, to, to other people, the world, um, their own community, I would expect too. Um, yeah. Another another symbol that's like running through my brain that isn't um, part of this book, um, but is I think uh, relevant to this idea of hope, and uh, it has to be said, hope against uh, in the face of um, overwhelming like odds stacked against you, right? Um, the feeling of like, well, I have to do this. I don't. Uh, it, it's almost like absurd this 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 gesture sometimes of resistance it could be um is um there's this cartoon figure called handala it's a little boy um he as he was uh i think developed by a cartoonist i'm just i just googled the name um but lost it uh naji al ali um sorry for the mispronunciation but um it's this really simple like boy with his back turned he has patches over his clothes and um he's almost like observing his hands are behind his back you can't see his face but he's observing things um uh events that are unfolding right in in his world um and it's become this like symbol of um a, a certain symbol for palestinians that i think like it it, it seems to me is like it's a kid, right? It's not this powerful like superhero, right? Uh, it's not like Batman. Um, it's it's someone who is like holding on to hope and it hasn't yet turned into, like hasn't grown up, um, but is extremely grown up in another way. Um, I feel like I'll stop there because um, I'm babbling, but I, I just found that to be a, a real potent symbol Yeah, that image, um, I must have seen it because it's familiar to me, or I don't know if he talked about it in the book, but um, something that's been on my mind that something that really floored me, not in this book, but like on October 8th, when I heard a, a Palestinian man say that he, you know, came out of he was able to get get out because the the wall was broken down or you know and he'd never been to Israel before and that blew my mind because like as a kid all Jewish young people are told that we have a birthright to go to Israel you know and that's just that's just yeah it's just like stuff is it it's a hard thing to swallow you know when I, I couldn't believe a guy said that like wow he's just right there he's not allowed to go in there that's that's what's driven a lot of my emotion that that guy's statement 
Yeah, that's um that's something that's mirrored in and even this collection in the first poem, which is an extended um what is it called? Uh Palestine A to Z, I believe is the title. Yes, Palestine A to yeah. Z. In yeah. letter Q, he says, Al Quds is Arabic for Jerusalem. I have never been to Al Quds. It's around 60 miles from Gaza. People who live 5,000 miles away can move there while I cannot even visit. Yeah. Yeah. I was really struck in the interview at the end when he was talking about um, growing up reading textbooks and feeling like he didn't have a childhood because every reference in the textbook was like, when you go on a field trip with your teacher to this place. And he was like, we've never been there. I've never been there. And feeling like he just couldn't like... Um, didn't have what was presented as like fundamental childhood experiences because of the restriction of movement um, in Palestine. Yeah, and, and the way he put that was, oh, sorry, the way he put that was, I've never, um, I never exercised my childhood, which I thought was such an interesting way of, of framing that. Um, it just, that I, I've never heard that expression and I think it's so, apt and um, powerful. Yeah, I was going to say there's another poem or maybe two in the collection where a child mistakes um, like, I think it's like clouds or, or he, yeah, he, he looks at clouds, a child looks at clouds and thinks, oh no, like, watch out, like there's smoke, a bomb went off somewhere, right? Like, how devastating in just a few lines to like understand that there's a real mindset of uh, that 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 children have to develop to survive in um, in a place of uh, yeah of, of war which to tie that back to time um, Musab Abu Tal was born in a refugee camp. His father was born in a refugee camp. His mother was born in a refugee camp. Um, and just the sense of place, the sense of home, the sense of community of like, even learning about what is Gaza or what Gaza used to be has been transmitted through, through stories um, and through like the memories of dead relatives to be shared. Um, I think at one point he referred to like, as Palestinians, our stories, our stories are the same in many ways. It's like living in a grave. We are not dead, but we go about our daily business. But in a grave, we're living in a place of a dead person. Um, and he has several poems about home and like the, what is home. Um, one is literally called what is home. <laughs> um and just the freedom of movement. There is one of my other favorite poems was to my visa interviewer, um, which is also like so fraught and stressful, but it's also kind of funny, like that it's like the frustration of your whole future is being determined by one person interviewing you or one uh, border patrol agent or one person who's deciding your whole future um like he traveled to the states at one point and was terrified that he would get rejected and have to return and have to go through everything again but there's no um embassies so it's just really difficult all around um but from this it's to my visa interviewer which one of me do you plan to interview? I am many, some I don't even know. Do you need to interview my clothes, books, toothpaste, comb, my baby son's diapers and napkins, the food not yet digested in my belly? It will find its way out before I get my visa. Um, and just how, like, kind of joking that it's going to take him a shorter time to digest digest his food and pass it before he'll have to fin like finish this interview and know his future um it's just powerful and upsetting and on a lot of levels I, I recall that one too with didn't he say something because he that he had to document all the addresses he's had in his life and so i mean that 
for anyone in, uh, who's a refugee, that's it's impossible. Marissa, one of the things you talked about is like you returning to this idea of home again and again and, and community shared stories. And I think it's something I was thinking about a lot reading this book. Like, you know, one of the first things we discussed is how the poems in this book like really focus on individual people and paint like very human faces and individual stories. But I also think this book is doing like so much work about like you have such a strong national identity, right? Um, which is not something that I particularly resonate with, right, for myself. And so it's, I think it's interesting to read about that and something that I think a lot of Palestinians share. Um, and there's a poem um, on page 15, it's called On a Starless Night. And it's the one where he, um, his neighbor's house is bombed and so he can suddenly see inside their house and he's saying, you know, I never knew you still had that small TV, that the old paintings still hung on their walls, that their cat had kittens. Um, that one really struck me, I don't know, for a lot of reasons, but I think one of the things I was thinking about is like, when you are constantly being displaced in that way, when you're in these refugee camps, like you also lose all sense of individuality, you lose all sense of privacy and your life is no longer like different and individualized from all the people around you. You're all experiencing this thing together. And I think, it, I don't know, it helped me make sense of why that would create such a strong national identity um, because you kind of lose the individualism. I don't know if other people <laughs> felt that way. But... There was, I, I recall a bit, um in the interview in the end and feel free anybody to jump in if you if you flag that particular passage which i haven't but he is talking about how um how this war this siege is stripping families of stories so that over time it, it becomes the case that this this violence against them that's happening now is their story like the the stories that are being told and will be asked of them by future generations is not like where are your grandparents from what were they like but you know what did you endure like which of your friends died how did you survive what did you eat how all of their family histories are being stripped away and replaced with just this one story of the violence that they endured I'm yeah, just, I don't. So I, I was just conjuring up the image of um, what Lily had described about, you know, the um, seeing into the apartment or the next door neighbors. Um, I don't have the book with me. So I, anyway, um, but yeah, that one, that one was very striking too. That, uh, but I can't, I don't remember the actual passages of which you speak, Roosevelt. Uh, but I did read it. <laughs> the poem that you were talking about, Lily, also reminds me of one of the um, the photographs. It's just of a destroyed building front, but it says the scent of coffee still hangs in the air, but where's the kitchen? It's the same idea that like, I mean, it's not really like peeking into people's worlds, but it's just like there was, there are people living here. There's life here. There's, um, you know, there was a kitchen and it's just, you can, it, things happen so quickly. There's the idea of drinking coffee, but then, you know, the rest of it is gone. And he has that other poem. I, I think it's him and his brother or two brothers where they're like drawing the house on the sand and um, kind of arguing about where, where things are, which I thought, was a great poem because it's taking like the little kid perspective you know it's like this all this stuff going on and there's things been destroyed but still you're going to do a very childlike thing which is create this map of a place and then argue with a sibling about who's done it right and who's standing in the kitchen and um so there's just so many different ways I think that he 
brings up the idea of home, his and others where other people live um, and like on a big scale and then on a very small individual, um, you know, here's where some people live. Yeah. Yeah, what you just said, Lucy, reminds me of another poem. I won't remember the name, <clears throat> but there's imagery of him like building, trying to build a home out of pebbles on the shoreline and that he's worried he's waiting for someone. And he's like, I'm worried that I will have rebuilt Gaza by the time you get back. I think there's some line to that effect, but that um, the image of like, I'm, I'm trying to like work in my way that almost feels right like sisyphean like to build something here and i'm gonna keep doing it you know um that uh right yeah like people he gave me the sense that he and many people are in in his situation or his community are trying desperately to like cobble together this existence of, of, of a home, of a community, of like place, right? Um, despite like being whatever surveilled and bombed. Um, and, I, and I just wanna say here, cause it hasn't come up in the discussion, like how often that like drones show up in these poems really struck me. Um, uh, again, my frame of reference, American, you know, like war on terror drones are these uh robots that go like fly and they're um un unmanned um and they're uh they target um you know some i don't know like hostile entity right and just um you know no muss no fuss right just go in and go out and and the I think that this poem exposes how like incredibly inhumane and um, merciless that that style of like modern warfare, quote unquote, uh, is. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's a few where it's talking about just how like unendlessly noisy it is there. Um, uh, in the interview, he talks about um, in the US, I could write about a tree bending down to drink from my teacup while I'm walking in the morning or a squirrel sipping from a glass I left on the porch. But while I'm in Gaza, I can only think about the constant sound of the drones, the F-16s, the seashore littered with bodies, um, which there's another poem by a different Palestinian poet, um, Marwan Makul, I'm sorry for the pronunciation, um, but it's been circulated a lot. Um, which in order for me to write poetry that isn't political, I must listen to the birds. And in order to hear the birds, the warplanes must be silent. There's a line in, in this book, in his, um, in the poem, in notebooks, where at the very end he says, I've, it's been noisy for a long time and I've been looking for a recording of silence to play on my old headphones. Another like maybe related thought um, that really struck me from like the last the interview at the end of the book is um, where he talks about how I, like maybe in another life like I would have been I don't know like a linguist like Noam Chomsky or something but I had to be a poet like this is what I had to do in order to like right like make sense make a life out of what like has been dealt me these conditions that I live in. Um, I don't know, yeah, like what you can and can't do. And I think he even starts the book um, out by saying like, it, it's hard to write these. <laughs> he start, the, the first few lines, nodding poems from shards of glass, concrete, steel bars isn't easy. Sometimes my hands bleed, my gloves get burnt every time. Like, all right, like, you he he is immediately letting me know like the amount of like work um that must be done here yeah lauren you were talking earlier about um about the 
building of a house that's mentioned in one of the poems um that i i flagged a few where uh construction or building is sort of a theme um and there there is one in um in the uh palestine a to z poem at the beginning where he talks about uh a poem uh he says i want to build a poem like a solid home but hopefully not with my bones um but he talks about the work of constructing a poem as you know something he's called to do to as part of this reconstructive project um and it, it sounds like also I, I picked up a few moments where it sounds like he's very aware of how you know the raw Uh, there's one um, Palestinian painter, I believe is the name. Yes. Um, he talks about a painter painting in the garden and painting uh, painting a new house, even a new garden, without shrapnel, without twisted metal beams, without broken bricks and loose electrical wires. But then I see him hesitate, looking at a headless doll lying in the rubble. I'm wondering if he'll paint it as part of the new house and the resurrected garden. It might destroy its harmony. It might disturb visitors from abroad. Uh, I was just really struck by this um, awareness of, um, let's say, a, a Western audience, for example, um, or you know, we might flinch away from these descriptions of of uh, violence and and destruction, but how necessary it is for for uh abu toha there's something special about poetry as resistance as affirming existence as like memorializing um all of these things and this process of of rebuilding and um something that i had noticed was missing from the book which i was so curious about <laughs> um just because a lot of american poetry tends to be about love or have strong love themes and i know that he's married and has children um and i had found in an interview that he um, is bilingual. He speaks Arabic and English. And so he said that when he writes poetry about love, he only writes it in Arabic because those poems are for his beloved and she doesn't read English. Um, and that's so cute. <laughs> yeah, that makes a whole lot of sense. I mean, I, I, yeah, like, uh, Right, that there's audiences here, like the wrestling that you were ref referring to, Roosevelt, of like with how am I, what am I saying, who am I saying it to? He he mentions right, he is bilingual, and 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 um, it would totally. I'm not, but I can totally picture how I would want to do, um, like have certain conversations with certain people in one language over another. Um, that that makes sense um and that even like further as a poet what am i what who is my audience here like when i'm writing in english what are we talking about um i didn't read this in this book but i read it elsewhere i can't remember now but um a, an a, it was a filipina artist uh who was talking about how like i don't have the like luxury of not making art I remember her saying that and it really struck me as someone who likes to make art right <laughs> um and and she was like I can't get like I don't have any time and any time for for anyone who says like I can't make our art and and um you know uh that I think that's why that line um in the interview by uh, with Mosab Abu Toha struck struck me too like I have to be this way I have to do uh, uh, be a poet. Um, and it really grocks with my American 
understanding, Marissa, you know, of like poetry is like about love and flowers, right? It's Shakespeare, you know, it's uh, Robert Frost and um, walking around in the countryside and uh, returning home and it's lovely, right? But like, it can be that and it can be like so much more. And I, um, I think in my adult life, I'm learning like, uh, that's the kind of poetry that really speaks to me, you know, um, it gets that expands that expanded uh, um, idea of what poetry can do. I'm reminded too in that conversation. Um, you know, another Palestinian poet who has since been assassinated, um, Rafat um, Al Arir. You know, he wrote a poem just a few months ago that has been wildly widely circulated and the last line of that poem is that you know if I must die let it be a story and I think that also speaks to the urgency that I imagine um Masa Babu Toha feels in bearing witness you know I, I one of the other poems I flagged of his was um sobbing without sound on page 25 which I won't read but I mean the whole thing is basically saying I actually don't feel like writing poetry at all I would love to feel like reading a book I would love to feel like writing a poem I have no motivation to do that, but obviously it's something that he's um, chosen to do anyway um, because of that urgency, which I admire. And I guess I feel gratitude that then we can all read it, you know, and help him bear witness in that way. We are coming up on time, the end of our hour. Um, does anyone else have any final thoughts the, to share or a poem or a line that they wanted to make sure that we talked about? I just think I just... Lily, Lily said it well, said it really well just now. I'm I'm so grateful that we um that we had this opportunity to together publicly bear witness. I'm I'm grateful that everybody showed up today. Um, well, then I will say everyone go read Things You May Find Hidden in My Ear. Um, he has a new book coming out in the fall that I believe is called Forest of Noise, which I'm looking forward to reading. Um, there's many interviews with him on YouTube and other Palestinian authors. Um, if you're looking for other recommendations, the, mention, uh, the group that I mentioned at the beginning, the Librarians and Archivists with Palestine, have lots of recommendations on their website for other authors to engage with um and thank you everyone for being here and sharing your thoughts about this book um and to everyone out there for watching it and engaging with us in that way and i wanted to leave um i wanted to leave on a, something the author said in an interview with the interview is called podcast um the podcast it's called gaza guy um he said that his final message for the interview, um, which I really liked, so I'm going to repeat it here. Um, his final message was, I hope people who are going to read my book will find something to learn about our life in Gaza, that they will share what they are hearing in my books with other people who don't know about Gaza. It's our lives, the lives of human beings, and I would like to ask people who have never lived in Gaza or Palestine or any occupied country I want them to imagine themselves being born in our place. What would they do? That's an invitation. Just imagine yourself being born in an occupied country, in war, in siege, etc. What would you do?